every move I make, I'm making you. You make me move, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Every step I take, I take in you. You are my way, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. In ways of mercy, ways of praise. Everywhere I look, I see your face. Your love has captured me. Oh my God, this love, how can it be? Every move I make, I'm making you. You make me move, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Every step I take, I take in you. You are my way, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Ways of mercy, ways of grace. Everywhere. I see your face, your love has captured me. Oh my God, this love, how can it be? Can it be? We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. It's together we sing. And everyone sings. Holy is the Lord. God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory, and holy is the Lord. God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. We stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he! And together we sing. Everyone sings. Oh, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. This the earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. And it's rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's renown. And it's rising. All around, it's the anthem of the Lord's renown. And together we sing, everyone sing. The holy is the Lord, God Almighty, the earth. Filled with His glory, and holy is the Lord, God Almighty. It's the earth is filled with His glory. It's the earth is filled with His glory. It's the earth is filled with His glory. 
God, to come to you and we thank you for your glory being all around us, that you would choose us to make your glory known and not because of anything who we are and that would glorify you even more, that you would do such great things with such low people. And in your son's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. All right, can you hear me? Okay, good. Well, good morning and welcome to our uh, indoor service at Grace Fellowship in Bill Verde. It's really nice to have you here. Uh, we can be thankful that we're indoors because of the great rain we had. So thank God for all of that. It's really good to see you. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord. It's good to worship with you this morning. And so I'm honored and privileged to bring you the word of God this morning. The scripture reading today is going to come out of the book of Philippians, and what we're going to do, if you open up your Bible to Philippians, start in chapter 1, we're going to walk through the book of Philippians up until chapter 4, and we're going to talk about a subject that's near and dear to my heart. We're going to talk about joy and the things that steal our joy. I think that's especially appropriate in today's environment, because I think a lot of us are having a hard time following what the scripture reading tells us to do this morning. The scripture reading is coming out of Philippians again. We're going to read chapter 4, verse 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Short verse, but it has a lot of impact. It's very powerful. So here's the word of God. Paul tells us, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Will you pray with me? Our grace and Father, Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us here to worship you. Lord, we thank you that we can worship a God who is powerful. We can worship Jesus Christ who saved us when we weren't worthy. Lord, now I ask that the things that may be cluttering our minds, the things that may be keeping us from hearing the word be pushed aside, and that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit, that you would have us to hear what you want us to hear. Lord Jesus, we thank you most of all for the grace given to all of us. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. So, you know, to be honest, this time of year or this last three or four months, I've seen a lot of people that really aren't joyful. In fact, you know, I fall in that category. Yesterday was an especially bad day for me. I was not in very good mood. And I, I keep thinking about that. I keep thinking about why, as Christians, we're not as joyful as we should be. You know, we have excuses, right? COVID-19. We have excuses, all the things going on in our country. We have excuses where, well, we can't do anything. The question is, is why don't we have joy? I can see it at work. I can see it at church. I can see it when I can see it through somebody's mask. You can see it in their eyes that there's a lack of joy. And the question is, why? So the real question is, is how should we act? How should we act as Christians, especially in times like this? How should we act as a church in the here and now of today? With all the things going on, what should we do? In Philippians, Paul gives us an answer. It's really not hard to understand. It's, they're pretty clear words. And Paul, fact, in fact, Paul is very clear. He tells us to rejoice, and then he gives us when to do it, always. Now, I don't know about you, but I love reading the words of Paul because Paul is a little bit uncomfortable when you're reading because he is direct in what he's telling you to do he's direct in his language and the thing that we don't understand as christians i think or we tend to forget is that paul's not suggesting something to us paul's not just saying this is a my suggestion on the way you should live your life paul's an apostle of jesus christ and paul is giving us a command to rejoice and to rejoice always. And I want you to think about that. I want that to sink in for a minute. This is a command, like, do not steal or do not murder. Paul's saying, rejoice and rejoice always. Now, this is really difficult, isn't it? Let's be honest here. This command's kind of hard to keep because there's all kinds of things that enter our lives that steal our joy. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. What Paul's really telling us is that a joyless Christian is really a person that's not like Christ. And I think that's critically important for all of us to understand as Christians. You see, we have a mission in this world. We have a mission for Jesus Christ in this world. And being joyless 
really hampers that mission of what we want to do. And we know that this joy and strength really does help us get past this life, get past the things that are going on in the here and now. The thing I want you to know is that God has ordained a life for you that is worth living. And we always need to remember that. We always need to remember the joy that Jesus brings. Now, to be honest with you, I struggle with this. And the the thing about being a pastor is is that I never really have a hard time figuring out what I'm going to preach about because I just look at my own self and the sermons just come. And, And I do have a problem with joy. I have a problem following this command of being joyful and doing it always. And the question is why? Why is this command so hard to follow for many of us that have Jesus Christ? And we ought to wake up every day and go, wow, we are saved by the grace of Jesus. We should be joyful every day, but we aren't. I think it's because we focus on the here and now as opposed to changing the way that we live our lives. And that's kind of one of what I address today. And I think that's what you see in the life of Paul. I think their simple answer is that there are things in our lives, in our daily lives, that simply steal our joy. They steal our joy. They rob us of the joy that we have. So what I want to do this morning is I want to walk through some things that are common joy stealers for all of us. And this is not an exclusive list. There are many things that are joy stealers in our lives. But I I want to address this. And then what I want to do is is I want to look at how Paul combated, how he took on these joy stealers. Because I think it shows us, it equips us. And that's what the scriptures do. The scriptures equip us to be successful and following Jesus Christ. Now, some background, which will help us understand this a little bit better. As the book, the book of Philippians is one of Paul's prison uh, epistles. So Br- Paul wrote a number of books while he was in prison, and there was different degrees of prison. He was under house arrest at one time. In the book of Philippians, he was under house arrest, and it's, it's not like you would, you would think of being grounded to your room. It was much more severe. Uh, Tradition says he was chained with a Roman soldier, so it was not a good scene. Later on, he would be in a dungeon in Rome as he awaited death, but here he's in house arrest. So he writes this book about joy when he's essentially in prison. And I want you to think about that for a second. Paul's in prison, and he, he decides to tell us to rejoice, and rejoice always. Here's a man who knew that serving Jesus Christ would cost him his life. He knew it. He was condemned. He knew that he was going to die. But yet he rejoiced always, and he commands us to rejoice always. And the question is, how is that even possible to rejoice like Paul tells us to do? What's even more extraordinary, even when you read his darkest days in the book of First and Second Timothy, when he knows he's going to die, you can feel the joy. You can hear the joy. See, Paul lived what he preached, and he knew he couldn't stop rejoicing because of Jesus. His joy is complete in Jesus, and nothing the world could throw at him would cause him to not have joy. So I want to pause for a second, just ask you a question to think in your own mind. How does that make you feel? It It should make us feel a little bit guilty, right? So here's an apostle who was beaten, who was stoned, who was executed, but he was joyful and joyful always. So the question is, why don't we? Well, once again, I think it's uh, the joy stealers in our life. So what I want to do is I want to walk through the examples of Paul through Philippians, and I think it shows us how Paul defeated these joy stealers. But it takes some work. Here's the first joy stealer. There were terrible circumstances created by the adversaries of Paul. And we can apply that to our own lives. There are circumstances that we don't create, but people create for us. So how did Paul overcome them? Let's look at Philippians 1.7. Paul says this, Is it right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have had you in my heart? And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. You know, Paul was in Roman bonds simply because of the hatred of others. He was hated by the Jews. He was hated by the Gentiles. He was hated by the Romans. You know, Paul was betrayed by very close friends. Friends that he trusted betrayed Paul. He was beaten. He was harassed. He was threatened at every turn. He was in jail because he simply refused to compromise his mission for Jesus Christ. Nothing else mattered to Paul. 
The glory of Jesus was all that mattered to Paul, and no matter what the cost. Now, most of us, I think, would not be overly thrilled to be treated like Paul. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be happy to be beaten or stoned or threatened or put in jail. And I can tell you that I don't think my joy would be complete if that kind of situation was with me. But Paul was joyful. And the question is, is how did Paul remain joyful with all these extraordinary circumstances that he encountered on a daily basis, on a, through his life, through his ministry? Well, I think the answer is perspective. Look at Philippians 1.12. It says this, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Do you hear that? Do you hear Paul telling us a truth that we all need to understand as Christians? Paul knew that God was working out his plan, his kingdom, through Paul. He knew that Paul was, Paul knew that he was just an instrument to God's eternal plan. And he looked at things from an eternal view as opposed to a here and now. The keys, this is a key we shouldn't miss. You know, Paul's perspective was that the trials and tribulations, all the drama that occurred in his life were just a small part on God's eternal plan, his divine plan for the life of Paul. So here's the good news. The same is true for each one of us in this room, each one of us that are listening to this word this morning. You see, God has an eternal plan for all of us, and we often forget that. We look at the things that occur in our lives. We look at the little trials and tribulations, and we, we focus on those, and we forget that we are part of the eternal plan of God, that this plan that God has put in place is eternal. It's not here and now. There's an Old Testament word that I don't say very well. And it's called mahashiva, and, and it essentially means this. It means blueprint. And what it tells us is that God has a blueprint for each and every one of us. No matter who you are, where you came from, God has a blueprint for your life. He has an eternal blueprint. He has a divine blueprint for all of you. And our perspective should be just that, that our existence is eternal. And what's occurring here and now in today, COVID and all the drama that's going on in our country is just a small blip on God's plan for all of us throughout eternity. Perspective allows us to be joyful, even when things aren't going so good, even when we've had these rough patches of life, even when we've had a rough life, this perspective allows us to be joyful because we have to understand our blueprint is a divine blueprint that God has in store for each and every one of us. We are part of God's eternal plan. We are part of the mission of Jesus Christ here in this world, and we should be grateful and joyful every time we think about the blueprint that God has for each and every one of us. Here's the next joy stealer. It's pride. Now, I think this is a big problem for most of us. I think it's a big problem for Christians. I think it's a big problem for those of us in churches. It's the sin of pride. And pride, in my view, is the root of all evil. It's the beginning of all sin. In fact, if you if you think about the evil one, he fell because of the sin of pride. He wanted to be greater than God. It was pride. And it's a supreme joy stealer for all of us who get caught up in this thing called pride. Look what Paul says about this in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but to each of you, to the interest of others. You see, we can become our own biggest enemies, can't we? And we, we're, we're usually the ones that cause our biggest problems. And I think Paul's trying to tell us this, that when we think of ourselves, when we, we want to be better than we think we are better, we often fall into the sin of pride. If we think we deserve better, we we'll soon become bitter, our, but our society demands this of us. It's something that's ingrained in the American psyche. When we compare our things and accomplishments to others, it drives us crazy when we don't match up to our peers. And I think if we're honest, we all know that's the fact. Even though God has abundantly blessed us, we always look across the street. We always look at other things, and it, it makes us crazy. The truth is, is that pride drives jealousness. Jealousness drives bitterness. Bitterness drives disappointment. 
Disappointment drives conflict, and conflict drives sin. Pride destroys every person from within. It must be confronted. It must be constantly battled. But the question is, how do we do it? You know, because pride is so ingrained in us, it becomes a massive joy stealer. So how do we do it? What do we do? So once again, we go to Paul the Apostle and learn what he did. You know, I don't know if you know Paul's background, but he had every reason to be proud, didn't he? Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He came from a long line of Pharisees. He was taught by the most respective Jewish teachers of the time. He was the upper crust of Jewish society. He had every reason to be a proud man. But once again, Paul realized something when he met Jesus. He realized that he would have to change the way he lived in order to be joyful because the pride that he had as a Pharisee was not joyful. So what did Paul do? How did he remain joyful? Well, the answer is once again found in the scriptures. He lived his life with humility through fear and trembling in the Lord. Let's look at the scripture. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Paul says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You see, my friends, the fact is, is that we need to walk and live our lives in fear and trembling before the Lord. Because anything better than hell is better than we deserve. I mean, people don't want to hear that. But it's the truth of life. It's the grace of Jesus Christ. And if we have that, pride simply can't be present. And we should realize that we don't deserve anything from God. He owes us nothing. And with this act of humility, the reality of our position before God becomes apparent. And then pride simply can't be present if we understand who God is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is, and who we are, and what we deserve, what we cannot earn, and what we've been given through the grace of Jesus Christ. Here's the third joy stealer, and it may surprise some of you, but the third joy stealer is our adherence to religious institutions, and it is a supreme joy stealer. You see it all the time with Christians. Now, you heard me. I said religion steals our joy, and we may be surprised about that, but let me distinguish it. Once again, let's look at the words of Paul in Philippians 3, 2, and 3. Paul says this, Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision who serve God by the Spirit who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. You see, my friends, religions can be a horrible thing. If you don't believe me, I challenge you to go and look up the history of religions. And I challenge you to see what we have done in the name of the church. I challenge you to look at it. Some of the most unhappy people I know are those people who are the most religious. They attend church services like uh, it's a funeral for the dead who have no hope. And religions, if we let it, can constrict our joy. I want you to understand that if our allegiance is to a church, if our allegiance is to a denomination, we forget what being a Christian is all about. Religion is not of God. It's man-made to help us understand the things of God. So our job, for example, is to realize we aren't Baptists first. We're not Presbyterians. We're not Methodists, but we are Christians. That's who we are, who follow Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we get it backwards. You know, when somebody says, what are you? I'm a Baptist. I'm a Southern Baptist pastor. No, I'm not. I'm a Christian who follows Jesus Christ. And we need to reset ourselves as Christians to realize that we follow Jesus. So how do we put our religion into perspective? How do we keep it from stealing our joy? Well, let's see what Paul did. And the answer, his answer was his relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians 3.10. It's a great verse. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him even in death. And there's our answer right there. I could stop right now 
And if we listened and lived this verse, we would know what joy is all about. You see, Christianity is about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about seeking him. It's about living for him. It's about worshiping him. It's about glorifying Jesus Christ. Nothing more. That's what joy is all about. Joy comes from putting on Christ. Joy comes from being sanctified in him. Joy comes from being identified with him. Joy comes from having an active relationship with Jesus Christ. Religions can simply rob us of that joy, of this relationship with Jesus. If our priority is made into a man-made institution, church is not a place to torture, my friends. Church should be a place that we can't wait to come because we are going to worship Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. We should be so joyful that we can enter the doors and worship Jesus instead of entering the doors of an institution. Paul goes on to give us our fourth joy stealer, and that's sin. Look at Philippians 3.19. Paul says this, Their destiny is destruction. Their God is in their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Here's, Paul, here's what Paul means. When we are controlled by our desires, the things that we like in this life, we'll lose our joy. The fact is, is that sinful living brings about sorrow and death. It's a bold statement, but it's the truth. Sinful living brings, or brings about sorrow and death. As Christians, we know that sin separates us from God. Truly, and you guys all know this, if you are living in sin as a Christian, there's an emptiness in your heart, isn't there? There's a void in your heart because we are separated right now from the Savior. How do we fix this? How do we recapture joy if sin is robbing us of the joy? If we are in sin, how do we fix it? Well, here's the answer. We follow the rules. Listen to what Paul says again in Philippians 3, 16 and 17. He says, only let us live up to what we have already attained, joined together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Let me give you a little secret. Holiness is happiness. There's the key to life. Holiness is happiness. You know, the rules keep us within the framework of happiness. They keep us within the framework of joyfulness. If we follow the rules of the scripture, we will remain joyful. I know that Kerry preached last week, and, and he talked about how the Old Testament, you know, Psalms and Proverbs meant a lot to him. And I couldn't agree more. I couldn't imagine if we just followed the Proverbs, you know, we followed those, we'd have a pretty joyful life because a lot of great advice in there. God has set the rules down for us to enable us to be joyful in life. They're the framework of joyfulness, which leads me to my fifth and final joy stealer. And those are the things of this world. Listen to Paul again in Philippians 4.10. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned but had no opportunity to show it. So in this verse, what's going on is Paul is acknowledging a gift of the Philippian church. The Philippian church had sent him some money and some gifts to help him maintain himself while he was in prison there in Rome. The people of Philippi, they were giving people, and Paul was writing them a thank you note. He was saying thank you. And Paul was saying, I know you don't have anything. I know that you are poor. I know that you don't have any money. I know that you don't have the things of this world, but what you have given has great impact because of why you gave it to me. You gave it out of love. You gave it because these things are important to you. The things that you have, the things that are here and now are not important. You know what's important. It is serving Christ. You know what is important is having the perspective of eternity, and I want to thank you because you have given me this gift. Paul was grateful, but he teaches us a lesson. Because increasingly in our society, increasingly in our churches, we think about the things of this world, don't we? It's important for us to have stuff. It's important for us to have enough money to survive. And it's amazing is these people, they didn't look at it that way. They looked at it as everything was a gift from God. The things that came to them was a gift, and they were to be shared everything that they received from God. 
We know that money can't buy us happiness, but we go after it all the time. We know that things can't buy us happiness, but we always want them. We want the new boat. We want the new stuff. We want the new watch. We want the new phone. And once we get it, we feel the emptiness inside. It just simply doesn't bring us joy. So what did Paul tell us to do? How did Paul tell us to overcome this joy stealer? What did Paul tell us to do? The answer is found in Philippians 4.8. It's about having faith in the things of God. Listen to what he says in Philippians 4.8. He says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Wow, those are strong words. And as I was writing this, I started thinking about that in my own life. Am I thinking about these types of things, or do I think about the things that don't matter in our lives? Listen to this truth. Joyful people find God in everything. Joyful people find God in everything. Happy people find God in everything. They think God always. You know, I, I preached back, I think, in February, and I told you about a billboard that I saw on I-35 that said, Thank God. And I keep remembering that when times are bad. When I keep remembering that when I'm focused on the here and now. I keep remembering that on when I'm like, oh, man, I'm having a bad day. I think about those two simple words, thank God. You see, joyful people thank God in every situation, in good or bad. They thank God. And they have the perspective of eternity. The truth is, when we seek the kingdom of God, God simply adds the things to us that we need. It's a fact. He gives us all we need, and once we understand that, we become joyful and satisfied. It's, a, it's kind of a, a formula that works if we follow the formula that Paul is telling us in the Scripture. Paul knew to be a, how to be abound. He knew how to be a base. He knew how to be joyful when he had plenty. He knew how to be joyful when he had nothing. He knew how to be joyful when he was about to die because his perspective was he was going to go see Jesus. So the question is for all of us as we close this morning, how's your joy? How's your joy? If it's not so good, then I encourage you this week to go and examine in your life what's stealing your joy. What is taking your joy? What is robbing of your joy? Because we need to know, my friends, that joy stealers are like snakes in the grass. They are always there to get you. And we should never kid ourselves to not think that Satan is always trying to steal your joy. Because if you're a joyless Christian, then you are an ineffective Christian. You're not fulfilling. You are not building the kingdom of God. You're not doing what God wants us to do, which is save others for Jesus Christ. A joyful Christian is a witness in itself. A joyful Christian makes people go, why is that person so joyful? What do they have that I don't have? But a joyless Christian causes them to just go on the other way. So how do we do this? Well, let me leave you with the words of a hymn that I sang a long time ago when I was a kid in Knoxville, Tennessee at a small Baptist church. And we're going to sing it here as our closing song. And it's a great old hymn. But the words are simple, and it says this. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full into his wonderful face, and the things of this world will graze, grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Couldn't say it any better. So as we leave here today, let's remember this prayer. Lord Jesus, let me help, help me always to remember to put you in the very center of my joy. And if we do this, if we focus on Jesus, then guess what? We will rejoice, and we will rejoice always. Let's pray. Our grace and Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for the reminders in the scriptures of what we are to do as Christians. Lord, we are saved. We know that we have been saved by Jesus Christ. And Lord, I ask that the Spirit reminds us every morning about the joy that this should bring. 
And Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that we respond to this urging by the Spirit, that we become joyful, that we change our lives, Lord, we change our attitudes to have a perspective of eternity, to have a perspective that we are part of the Mahashaba of God, that we are part of the blueprint of building God's kingdom, Lord, that we are part of your divine plan. Lord Jesus, help us to know that as a church and as a people. And Lord, if we do that, we will save the world for Jesus Christ, one person at a time. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much, most of all, for the sacrifice, for the gift of grace that we didn't deserve, that you gave us on that cross. Lord Jesus, we pray all this in your holy name, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.